Thank you all for uh, expressing your interest in, in this course. Uh, for today, uh, as Brother Karim just mentioned, inshallah, it will only be a, a very quick presentation of an outline of inshallah. It will become a, a course, a complete course on aqaid or theology. Um, so there's maybe some, let's call it logistic methodology and outline. So I'm gonna have a second version of the presentation here. I'm sorry that it doesn't show very clearly. Um, so maybe first and foremost, we start with the topic in Arabic is called Usul al din or Aqaid or Ilm al-Kalam, which roughly translates in Kalam. I don't know if you have heard the term before or not, Ilm al-Kalam or Kalam. It roughly translates as dis discursive theology or theology for short or beliefs or credo or doctrine. For our purposes for this course, we're going to use all of these terms very interchangeably. There is no real need to go into more detail, although there is, it could be very interesting, for instance, to study the history of how we got to the word kalam or ilm al-kalam and how, you know, there's even a political dimension that came all the way from the Abbasid time all the way to our time and it's still called ilm al-kalam or the, you know, the study of kalam as a specific field. Uh, when in reality the beginnings of it were mixed between theology, Islamic theology, and even politics. But that's for, for another discussion. Um, so for our purposes, as we said, we'll use all of these terms interchangeably. Um, when the brothers approached me uh, a few months ago initially um, to see what would be the topics of interest that could be used for, for a course here, uh, I think some of the brothers in attendance remember that we had a first chat and we discussed uh, possible topics of interest. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we have to choose one, uh, it has to be beliefs or aqaid. And there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, I think let's look at it from the religious reason, although we should end with that. I'm going to start with that. Uh, if we go to the Quranic verses and we go to the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhi uh, theology or aqaid is always mentioned as being the foremost in religion. From the first sermon of Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahj al uh, after he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Awwal al-Dini ma'rifatuh. The foremost in religion, the beginning of religion is knowledge of God. Ma'rifatullah wa ma'rifatuh. So, and the narrations are in the hundreds if we want to start talking about the importance of theology and the place it occupies in religion uh, and the obligation of learning the articles of faith and belief in Islam and in our madhab specifically. Uh, they are literally in the hundreds if not the thousands. So that's one, one reason, let's call it the religious reason uh, for the importance of theology. The second reason is simply that when we look at our communities in general, anywhere in the world, uh, especially in today's world where everybody's connected to everyone, anything that happens anywhere else in the world, we're exposed to it. The amount of ideas and schools of thought and intellectual movements and uh, all such things are proliferating. They're increasing by the day and we're exposed to them. And then when we look at the Islamic community in general, and when we look at our madhab particularly, we see that these ideas are, are not met with neutrality. We are very easily influenced by this, let's call it external influence. Uh, and at times it's very far reaching, and at times it's just enough to create doubts and questioning. And, and this is an indication, it's symptomatic of something. This is symptomatic of the fact that maybe the beliefs that we have, the faith in our belief system is not as solid as it should be. So whenever we're exposed to these different ideas, and this is normal and it's healthy to be exposed to different ideas, 
uh, any society, any point in history, whether you take a small community or a big society, is going to be exposed to external ideas. Uh, and it is up to it to take the good and leave the bad and be in basically an intellectual negotiation with the rest. But there's a precondition to that, which is you have to have the tools necessary to assess those ideas. And in the cases where you don't have the answer that's ready, at least you know where to look and who to talk to and how to think and how to address the issues. And if we look in our communities, I think there's a huge lack in, in anything and everything related to the belief system that we have. So let's say from a religious perspective, we do have the narrations and the verses, but from a rational, logical perspective as well, this is the reason why we do have to start with the belief system. The third reason that we can mention for the importance of choosing the theology as perhaps the first topic for a course uh, is simply that in addition to this second point, we're also in a minority situation. Here, specifically, living in the West, but increasingly in the world, it's smaller communities living in a bigger current, and maybe the numbers, if you look just at raw numbers, maybe in numbers there are more religious people than non-religious. But the reality is that the power and the media and the culture is not with the religious thought. It's actually against it. And if we look at things like scientism or the movement of science, for instance, or secularization or such movements, generally speaking, they're all against many of our foundations. So this is kind of the third main reason why. We said there's a religious reason, there's a second, let's call it rational, logical, cultural reason, and then you add to that another layer, which is we live in a minority situation. This is additional uh, reason for us to look more closely at our belief system and make sure that it is even more solid, even more solid, so that we are able to work with a majority current going against us. The second point that I wanted to talk about is uh, the structure of what we're going to be addressing or presenting is going to be a lot closer to lessons as opposed to uh, maybe what most people are used to in our communities, which is the format of the majlis, the Husseini pulpit, uh, and you have a lecturer, a preacher presenting a topic. And for the majority of people, the, their education, their religious education comes from that Husseini pulpit. And there is no doubt that the Husseini pulpit plays a very important role in our communities uh, from many different angles. And I'm sure you will hear all about it in a few months again when the holy month of Muharram will be upon us. The problem with the lectures though is that most often, first of all, they are random. So you may get a topic here and a topic there that directly or indirectly touches on theological articles and theological items. And secondly, the presentation is not meant to be delivered like an academic course. There's a performance, oratory performance in it. Uh, you are talking to the masses. You have to be able to entertain. You have to be able to enliven and bring up the emotions. This is a very different context than being in a classroom where you actually go through subject matter in a very systematic manner from beginning to end. There's no randomness. You don't talk about, you know, side stories and dreams and myths and anything else that may or may not serve the purposes of a Mumbai lecture. And so for us, what would this mean uh, in very concrete terms is that during the lectures, uh, we are going to require a lot more focus, especially because, inshallah, if we go and move as planned and we don't have technical difficulties next time, um, <coughs> there is a lot of subject matter to cover in a very short period of time. And we don't want to dwell on the topics. And we have to move together as a group. We can only move as fast as the slowest person in the group. So we have to make sure that everybody is uh, fully 
uh, let's say, brightened and illuminated at all times. So you have to maintain the focus. We'll keep the lessons shorter to, to an hour at the most. I'm aiming at 40 minutes and we'll see how it goes with the first few lectures. Uh, but it means that it goes fast and you do whatever you got to do. Many of you have already gone through university courses and if it means taking notes, do whatever you got to do as you would do in an academic setting. But the delivery is a lot closer to an academic setting than, for instance, a majlis. The uh, perhaps second item related to that is the importance in such a setting of uh, maintaining regular attendance. So this is in general, in any academic setting, the ideas are like a chain. And if you miss a piece, it's gonna be very difficult to catch up after. So that's in general, but we're talking about aqaid. So aqaid has a specific additional layer of issue related to missing lectures. And this is often something repeated in, in courses in Hawza and the Islamic seminary when they teach theology. This mention, this uh, point is often mentioned. So it may not apply 100% to our setting because this is, and I will talk a little bit about it, it's not supposed to be an advanced course. We're starting from the beginning and we'll move as high as we can in the details given the, the crowd, the audience that we have. Still, that said, uh, there is always a possibility of being exposed to questions, to doubts, to objections, to ideas that we have not been exposed to before. And this can lead to shaking up completely what we thought, what we believe to be the truth about our religion. And this can be the case for anyone. From our greatest scholars to someone who's just starting into religion today, you are going to be exposed to questions, concerns, objections that will force you to rethink some of your beliefs. This happens to everyone and it's normal. We have a lot of people, for instance, consider Sayyid Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr as a genius among our scholars. And we know when, from, from reading his biography and, and his history and his interactions with his students, at some point he says there was a philosopher and a mathematician called Bertrand Russell. And he says that as he was reading some of his works, at some point, Bertrand Russell was making some claims that Martyr Shahid al-Sadr said were very problematic to the point where he thought no one had answered them. And if they were true, then our understanding of our beliefs is very problematic. There are gaps in what we currently have that do not address these concerns. So he says, the shubha, the doubts that this created in his mind, it's not that it shook his belief system, but he knew that the methodology we have does not address this. So he's fair. He doesn't you know, use a, some circumvented way to say, yeah, but still we can patch it up. He's saying what we currently have in our belief system does not address these concerns. And he says he lived with this problem, with these issues for two full years. He says, when I ate, when I slept, when I woke up in the morning, and even when I prayed, these issues were obsessively nagging in my mind for two years. The result of those two years is when he wrote his book, The Principles of Induction, of Logical Induction, for those who have heard about it, The Principles of Logical Induction, where he basically said, so long as we maintain the logic of Aristotle, which is still used in today's Hawza. So long as we continue to use that kind of logic, we are going to be stuck and no one will be able to answer these objections. So I'm going to create a new logic. That one is going to be based on the logic of probability and not Aristotelian logic. And that one will be the answer to these questions. This is just to use an example to say even at the highest level, when we think someone has completely mastered the available subject matter, you can still be confronted with questions and objections and ideas that will shake up your what you believe to be the truth. The way this applies to our setting is we're talking about aqaid. So obviously, a lot of the manner in which we present things is 
It's questions and concerns and objections to what we think is our belief system. So attending one <coughs> lecture, one session, and not attending the next one, you may actually have the question nagging in your mind, and you never hear the answer to it. So I'll talk a little bit about the textbook that we're going to use, and inshallah we won't fall into that problem because of the way the textbook is, is structured. But a lot of this depends on our ability to actually deliver full sessions from beginning to end every time and not lacking time. Otherwise we'll say and we'll continue next class. And then everything depends on are you going to be present next class. So that's the biggest issue related to Aqaid in general. That you never want to miss if it's a, a cycle, if it's a course pack, you don't want to miss parts because they're all connected. And then you can actually be left with questions to which you heard the problem, you heard the issue, you heard the objection to our faith, and you never heard the answer to it later. Okay, so let's talk about the textbook and the curriculum. Um, so I guess we had three options for, for this course. Uh, the first one being that we kind of make it free flow uh, and as the weeks go by we present I'm not gonna say random topics related to theology but topics that are somewhat structured and somewhat free-flowing uh, and given the the issues that we mentioned at the beginning which is the need for a lot more rigor a lot more rigor a lot more uh, systematic presentation a course on theology, uh, we really shouldn't go towards that option, which is no curriculum. So the second option would be that we actually develop a curriculum specifically for this group. And that could be, in certain <coughs> aspects, ideal, because it would be personalized, customized to the people in attendance, to their level and to their objections and to our reality. But there are two issues with that. The first one is, uh, it takes time to do that, and personally right now, I don't have the time to do it. The second reason, uh, which is I think an important reason, the hope is that once you guys are done this course, is that you can actually say, I finished something. And you can actually concretely point to it and say, this, I was able to complete this. Just like you say, I have a certificate in something. I was able to do it from beginning to end. It has a beginning and it has an end. So in order to do that, you need a textbook. You need a curriculum to follow that has a clear beginning and end. Then the question becomes, so which curriculum do we follow and what book do we use? And so, uh, I don't know, I don't know what slide is. Yeah, this one is good. Um, so there's numerous works right now out there in terms of theology. These works started with the Zaman al ghaybah from the time right after Zaman al-Imam al-Mahdi Allah Faraja and they've been written since that time until today. And if we want to be very generic, many of these books are currently being used as textbooks. That said, a number of them are currently being used a lot more classically. So the majority of the teaching centers around maybe five, six books. Each of these books has its own merits, and each of them has its own, I don't want to necessarily call them shortcomings, but maybe they're not the best, depending on the purpose that you want to get out of them. So the book that finally I, I decided to follow for, for this course uh, is actually a book written by a scholar by the name of Sheikh Muhammad Taqi Musbah al-Yazdi, uh, which has very recently been translated a few years ago. Uh, as uh, theological instructions. Um, to be honest with you guys, this is a course or a course pack or a textbook that I actually translated about maybe 17, 16 or 17 years ago. Uh, but it was for my very personal use to teach in English because it wasn't available in English at that time. Uh, and since then, about 10 years ago, it appeared in published form. Uh, and very recently, I, I took a look at it just to go through all the various textbooks to see which would be most appropriate. So one of the first merits that this book actually has uh, is that it's available in English. 
So that already, I think, makes the, the, the teaching a lot easier for anyone who wishes to also follow the textbook as we, we progress through it. The second reason that this textbook might be very appropriate uh, is because of the author. So the author is known in the Hausa and the Islamic seminaries as, first of all, being a, generally a high-level scholar, uh, but specifically because he specializes in these, what are usually called uh, al or the rational sciences in the Hausa. So philosophy, theology, and arfan, and akhlaq, moral philosophy. Um, so when you have a specialist writing a book, you can kind of rest assured that at least this is his field and he knows what he's talking about and you don't need to look two or three times before accepting or rejecting what he's giving you. Um, more reasons, more merits to this book uh, is that it is a, written in a very modern style. So the presentation of the content is modern. Uh, the wording in Arabic and therefore translation in English is a lot more modern. He tries to avoid terminology, very specialized terminology, even in Arabic. So it makes it a lot easier to translate and to comprehend in English as well. Uh, and even, and I think this is perhaps the most important aspect of this, at the notional level, he, I'm going to say balances to the best of his ability uh, between modern theological issues and classic medieval theological issues. Many of the books, the majority of the books that are currently used in the Hausa actually come to us from very medieval periods. So we're talking about the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. And although at the philosophical level, many of the arguments that are being made are perfectly valid, the presentation does not work for today's world. That's one. Two, they were addressing issues that they were dealing with in their time. They were not trying to foresee what possibly could be objected to in our religion in 10 centuries, which is what we're confronted with today. So what we have in this book, at times, not always, that's why I say he balances between the classic theological arguments and, and premises that we need, as well as some of the more contemporary issues that many of us deal with on a more day-to-day. -day. And that's why right from lesson one, we'll fall into, for instance, the whole discussion about worldview and ideology, which is, if you go back to the works of Allah Mahili or Shaykh Tusi, these notions did not even exist. Uh, a notion of a worldview or an ideology. Um, another merit of the book is that it, it's actually a complete work in theology. So not all books actually present a full, I'm going to call it a cycle, a full cycle of theology taking you from the beginning, the first articles of faith from Tawheed all the way to the end of Muhammad. This book does a very good job of that. So it, you actually do get exposed to all the main issues. And finally, it's methodological. So he follows a very rigorous method, methodology. If I'm starting into the faith system, and I'm just about to see why do I need religion, my argument cannot be because the Qur'an said. I don't have religion yet. You cannot tell someone who doesn't believe in religion, Imam Sadiq said. It doesn't work. So this requires a rigorous methodology. And this is what we get in this book as well. So right from the beginning, you'll see that it's a lot more based on rational arguments. Until we can establish that the Qur'an is an authentic book from God, then we can start relying on it for some proofs. And until we can establish that the Imams are infallibles that are appointed by God, then we can rely on what they're saying as arguments in themselves. And in the preface of the book, the author himself talks about some of these merits, and I'm not going to go in detail. There's two points that he does mention that I think are very worth uh, mentioning as well. The first one being that the book is meant for an intermediary level. So this requires a little bit of an explanation so that we know what we're studying and at what level it is and what does it mean to say intermediary. I think there's two ways to look at this. The first is we look at the works themselves. So a beginner level work, and we're talking about the Hausa or the Islamic seminary world. 
an introductory level work or a beginner level work would basically give you a listing of what you need in that field without providing much evidence or discussion or proof for what is being claimed. An example of this, you take Rasal al-Amaliyya, you take the, the book of verdicts of the Marjik, and you will see that he basically tells you, you know, this is how you perform your prayer. Don't ask me about the proofs. I'm not gonna give you any evidence here. I'm just gonna tell you what to do. Here's a list of everything you need in this field. If you go aqa'id, if you go akhlaq, if you go, and you take any field, if the book does not provide any evidence, it's just basically a listing of what you need to say you are in that sphere, which is in this case within the madhab, for instance, within Islam, that's a beginner level book. You take it to the next, I'm gonna take the extreme first. On the extreme end, the opposite end, what we have are works written by specialists for specialists. The author is trying to show his full caliber to the other specialists in the field. So he may not talk about the stuff that everybody agrees on. So already it's not complete. And it adopts a very critical approach because he needs to say, and this is right because, and this is wrong because, and this one we accept half and half because. So he needs to show what he thinks about every proof, every piece of evidence available in that field. So again, if you don't have the tools, you don't know where he's skipping over stuff and where he's, this is jumping into the advanced world. And then you have the intermediary works. So basically an intermediary work, you get the list that we talked about in the beginner level, and you also get some level of evidence and argumentation and proof for each of these items. If the level of argumentation doesn't go very far, then yes, it is an intermediary level, but it's closer to the beginner. And you also have works that are intermediary, but they really go deep into the analysis and the proofs and the arguments, and that becomes a lot closer to a specialized work. So when we say intermediary, it's a very large spectrum, and you have to know where you're falling in there. That's, I think, the general approach that most people take. I want to take a slightly different approach, and it's good for you guys too, if ever you engage in any sort of religious studies. The level does not really depend on the book. It doesn't depend on the work. The level depends on the intent of the teacher teaching the book. And today, if you go to these religious classes, you will see that some of the works that are used, there are very small works that should be used as a beginner level work, and yet the scholar stays in teaching that course for six years, let's say, because he's really going in depth in every article and adding his point of view and adding all the critique and adding all the points of view that he's aware of. So although the work itself is a beginner level work, the presentation and the teaching is at an advanced level. So a lot of it has to do with the approach that we want to take. Um, sorry. Okay, so this was for the, uh, the intermediary level. Um, yeah, for us, I'm gonna go a little bit faster. I'm hoping to finish in the next couple of minutes. Um, so for our purposes, because we are not fully aware of the levels of the people attending uh, and their in interests, and we'll ask a couple of questions at the end, uh, perhaps it's safest to go with an intermediary level and teach it in a generic way, but starting with the beginner level and going all the way to intermediary in every topic. Um, so concretely what this means for this book is that when he, he talks about all of the main issues, as we said, but let's say an issue in the classic literature has seven pieces of big evidence, seven arguments to prove something. Let's say we're talking about divine justice, for instance. Let's say there are seven big opinions about this. He's not gonna mention seven in this book. He probably will most likely mention one. He will hand pick, he will select the one that he thinks is most appropriate. It's the most robust one without needing all the premises that require a very extensive work, and he'll present that one. So in most cases, we're going to rely on the same methodology, but we'll add to it wherever it's necessary. That's the intermediary level. Finally, and I won't take, take too long on this, this is a pedagogical work. It's meant, and he talks about this in the preface, it's meant for teaching. 
And this is a lack that we have in our books when they are taught. Our scholars often take a book because the author is an established authority, because the work has very nice, rich notions, for instance, but the book is not meant for teaching. And we mentioned some of the reasons why a scholar may write a book. The, when the scholar is not thinking that this is a book for teaching, it's not written in the same way. So this book is actually written as lessons. It's three volumes divided each into 20 lessons. The first volume has a Tawheed and Al Ad, so monotheism and divine justice. Volume two has prophethood and imamah. And volume three has all of the, what's referred to as eschatology or Al Ma'ad or the afterlife. So the way, if anyone wants to actually read and follow in the book, the way it's written, you will have a very clear beginning and end to every lesson, and it actually even has questions at the end to summarize that course. So I'm not going to go um, spend too much time on this, but the outline of the book uh, is here. And this basically gives you an idea of the number of lessons devoted to every topic. And generally speaking, as I said, it's 20 lessons per topic. A quick uh, overview of very, let's consider them very final remarks. The first one, uh, I'm hoping to uh, present um, the book in a way that's uh, fully autonomous, so that you don't necessarily need to go back and read the book. And I also do not intend on actually doing, following the classic way, which is reading the actual book and commenting word by word. So from every lesson, we'll take the most important arguments and topics and subtopics from it, and we'll build a little lecture and session around it. And for those who wish, you can prepare the lesson before by reading it. You can follow up after and go back and see. You decide what you want to do. I'm not intending on reading it you know, word by word. That's first. And the book in English translation, as well as in Arabic, is available online. If you just uh, Google theological instructions, Sheikh Muhammad Taqi Musbah al Yazdi, you will find it very easily. Uh, and during the lectures, and I think we, we mentioned that it would be a more of a lesson style, so it's better if there are no interruptions during. There are people of very different calibers who are listening. So something that may be very hard for someone to understand may be very easy for another to understand. And we want everybody to uh, you know, appreciate the time that they're spending on this and not waste anyone's time. So we'll leave questions and concerns and comments after uh, every session. And uh, I think with this, this was kind of just a test and I wanted to see how many people would show up and this is my uh, opportunity as well to see uh, if you guys are okay with this just to give me an idea if anyone has had any exposure to theolo theology in terms of a class or a course or even readings in general anything systematic beyond the general exposure to the, to the Majalis so if anyone has any uh, exposure in terms of an, more of an academic setting or classroom or lessons that's what i'd like to know and anything else related to anything i said or about questions concerns comments about the lesson in general and how maybe the brothers can talk a little bit more about how they're hoping to structure all of this as well so uh, for myself so i just like to maybe just very quickly raise of hands and if anyone has anyone been exposed to uh, more formal structural lessons in theology yes okay can i know what what textbooks or styles or formats were used so that it gives me an idea yeah i used this book with the sheikh shumal okay so was it from beginning to end from beginning to end how and many I lectures a online it was, uh, there's a copy online yes so how many lectures I think he'd read around uh, maybe 35, 30 lectures on 30, 35. Okay. Something like that. More All three volumes? So no, tell no, 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 he chooses what we It's like chose. a bit similar to your approach that okay. he chooses what we Okay. Um, this book? Yeah. With uh, Sheikh Ali uh, Khamari. Okay. Uh, he went on it all. He did it for the university level student. Okay. He went on with it for like two, three years. 
for every two weeks. So he okay. took me the uh, the uh, first one, okay. uh, talking to other other lot of justice. And had, yes. Yeah, uh, and then I think we went to one or two. We some the, the class was kind of after that, so we would stop like at our prophet's hood. And the moment that then we started diving into the Quran, we think we've already established the relationship between our lost prophet and the Quran. And then because we already had a belief in the Quran, he was able to refer to the Quran and the Hadith, but we never got to the mad. Uh, okay. Here after that. Yeah, really good. Okay. Uh, and yes? Yeah, kind of similar to this as well. So back in Toronto, uh, in one of the mosques on Sunday mornings, there uh, was uh, a, a, an expert, kind of. He wasn't a sheikh, but he had some um, expertise in, uh, in, in his principles. Uh, his name was uh, Mr. Fazili. So he basically you know, ran the classes, and um, yeah, so basically went through Tawhid, Nabuwa, and uh, um, and Imama. Uh, no, I don't think he followed the, in any particular book. I think he would just used his uh, kind of like readings in he general. He prepared his own lectures. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, okay. And here? No, I'm sure that I know. Yes, sorry, yes. Uh, well, I was, in, I was in my first year, first year recovering uh, the book by Ayatollah and Nasrul Khan Shalazan. Yes. Yeah. I think he has two. He has two. The one that we have was uh, for the youth. Yes, okay. Right. So yeah. And so they are also. Level. Yes, it's entry level and it's also lessons. Exactly. Yes. It's similar to that, but entry level too. Right? And then with Medicine of Khomeini, there are two books. We're in. in one semester, we're using uh, Ilahiyat by Yatul Yes. And then semester two was that book. Oh, this book, okay. So it's usually like, you know, it depends on which teacher. That's why I was like, I was a bit. Okay. Frustrated because I like to be consistent with one book. You want to finish it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because one book was like with one teacher, he was more of a philosopher and a fan. The other was like Hadith philosophy, and... manta, and tarikh. Okay. Right. So it's like there's two yeah, different. So the styles. methodology is changing. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And well, yeah, you are. same to same Musa. Okay. Shabshumali. Okay. But I didn't fully continue the course. Okay. And in the sisters, can I ask if anyone has done any full courses? Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I, I did the, the course with Sheikh Ali Khamenei. Okay. A few months, so I didn't finish that. But then I did uh, the one with Sheikh Shumani, and I did it, uh, I think, yeah, I finished the whole course. Okay. So I read most of the work. Okay. So you you read, but was there an explanation of all the course, all the lessons? Yes, yeah, so I listened. I, I did all the lectures on the on the book, and I read a lot of the book also. Okay. Yeah, I read the book too. Okay, so he read. So he used the class. No, I read the book oh, you before read. the lecture. No, Sheikh Shumel usually he does like lecture like that, and yeah. then you have the book to read too. Okay. So I'm gonna take you. He was very consistent look. with the book. Yeah. He goes outside of it, but I read the book and I'm really close to what he said. Okay, so I'll, I'll take a quick look at uh, the lectures of Sheikh Shomari just to see his style. And I'm going to try to stick as much as possible to the work so that you guys get the clear outline for those who want to follow. The reality is that behind the scenes, what I'm going to do is I'm complementing the book with all the other major works. So I am looking at Al-Bab al-Hadi Ashar, and Aqaid al-Imamiyya, and Tajrid al-Atiqad, and Ilahiyat al-Subhani. I'm looking at all of those, and whatever is appropriate for this level is going to be added to the book as part of the lessons. Part of what I wanted to ask is that we're trying to be as rigorous as possible and as respectful of the time and of the organization as possible. So as I said, this book is organized in 60 lessons. We can say that we are going to stick to the same, our schedule is going to match the organization of the book, so that if there is one lesson in the book, it means one session between us. Or we say, we take the time we need to take, so if it means, if the discussion or the questions require more sessions, then we'll add more sessions in order to cover a topic more extensively. So this is what I was gonna ask. And of course, both have a benefit and a, and a detriment. 
the detriment is that we will not finish in 60 lessons. And as I mentioned to, to some of the brothers here, I am aware of seven different teachers having taught this course in Arabic. Uh, and on average, every lesson in the book uh, is explained between two and three lectures that are usually 45 minutes to an hour. We are trying to cover every lesson in about 40 minutes here. So obviously it's gonna be condensed and we're moving fast. So if you guys prefer, we stick to the schedule. And I, I, my proposal is that we start with that and we see how it goes so that we actually move and the brothers who have had the frustration of starting the book and never finishing it or maybe skipping parts of it, we actually get the full book and you are done from beginning to end. At least you can say we finished volume one, we finished volume two, we finished volume three. Or we finished the Tawheed, we finished the Adl, we finished the Nubuwa. Um, but I leave it to you guys to decide how you want to do this. I can send the question about the email and then they can answer it maybe. Yes, then do a survey or... Oh, there's going to be exams as well? I'm not intending to do exams, <laughs> but I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> I may quiz, okay? I usually quiz either at the beginning or the end okay. to make sure I go with a... You know, if there are fine details that I'm not sure people grasped in the last lecture or we went too fast over a topic, I may grill some people in yeah. the next topic or towards the end to see to what extent. And it's not about the person. No. It's to kind of get the pulse that was it understood or do we need to go back over it again? Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, So inshallah, just um, I'll have a quick announcement because it's very time. Uh, first of all, sorry again for the technical difficulty. We started like 20 minutes uh, after the started time. So inshallah, uh, the next session will start at 8. Technically, it will start at 8.05, 8 8.05, but we're welcome to come a bit earlier so we can start directly. Inshallah, hopefully the next session will have the slides on the, like, on the screen. And uh, I didn't have the chance to introduce Sayyid Jafar, so inshallah I'm just going to introduce Sayyid Jafar. So Dr. Sayyid Jafar Hassan is a Canadian Islamic researcher. His academic background includes translation studies, law, and philosophy, as well as traditional Islamic sciences. He currently holds uh, the position of a director of the government of Canada. And for the Art Center, just a quick introduction. So the Art Center, uh, the official name is the Canadian Art Center of Excellence. Uh, we opened in January, we rented this place and we started. Mainly the art center was for brothers, that's how we started it. But this is the first program that we include system, inshallah. We'll have more programs and branch for the systems in the future. Um, so this center, we collaborate with all the community, Lebanese, Iraqi, Pakistani, but we're not under any, any community. The main language is here, as you see, it's only English. We don't have any other official language and it's only based on the uh, we have the monthly members like we have like 24 paying members that they take care of this place um, and inshallah you can have uh, you can see more information on the website or on facebook you can follow us on facebook uh, about this course uh, as the said inshallah we'll talk more about it don't be scared about the 60 lessons. It will not be every be every <laughs> every Saturday. Like we'll take some breaks. For example, in Muharram we, we may stop, and inshallah the Sayyid will uh, will talk about these later when should we stop take a break and, uh, and or maybe we can divide it by like Tawheed and Ruhani and stuff like that. Inshallah, I'm going to send the outlines, the slides that the Sayyid uh, used today. I'm going to send it by email. So if anyone here is not included in the broadcast emails that I already sent yesterday, please uh, let me know or send an email to the Art Center email. And thank you so much for coming. Assalamu alaikum.